I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, as I said in the program, my name is Johnny Simpson Jr. Uh, a little bit about me, I am the pastor at Haven Chapel United Methodist Church in East Columbia, Texas. I've been there for about three years um, since the other two combined and became Community of Love Church. I uh, was appointed to Haven Chapel. I am originally from Indianapolis, Indiana by way of Freeport, Illinois. So I was born in Freeport, moved to Indiana, and uh, then came down here to Texas to go to Prairie View A&M University. Uh, been here since about 98. Uh, got a bachelor's in business and then went on to school and got a master's degree and then I uh, accepted my call. It's a funny story, but uh, one of my good friends, uh, Stefan Arrington, who is pastor of uh, Wesley Tabernacle, we uh, were together at Windsor Village, and he started the process a little bit before me, and he probably called the process, the, the calling in me out before I did and wanted to know why I was wasting my time going to school for a bunch of other stuff, because I started off an engineering major, then went to business, and then graduated. Um, I am married. I have been married. I will be married for six years in July. Uh, I have two children. Uh, Johnny Simpson III, who just turned four in February, and L.B. Simpson, uh, who will be three in June, and my wife, Latia Simpson. Uh, other than that, I'm just somebody who loves to talk about Jesus. I do have a, uh, I, I know the program says uh, uh, acknowledgments of guests and all that, but I'm going to take a little pastoral privilege and acknowledge one guest already, uh, my mother, uh, Latane Bruce. She's, um, uh, I think in uh, 10 years or so I've been preaching, she's only missed one sermon. And uh, <laughs> and so I, 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 I told her when I got the call from our district superintendent to come fill in, I told her, and she was like, where's that? I'll be there. Amen. So uh, thank you for making the trek as well, Mom. Uh, let us pray. Gracious and Holy Father, King of kings and Lord of lords, need your Holy Spirit to come down and fall fresh upon us Lord God let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight make it that I decrease Lord God so that you must increase Lord God and that your word be a seed that is planted in good soil and produces good fruit Lord God in the name of Jesus the great I am we pray Amen. Uh, for the time that is ours to share together, I want to talk a little bit about the conclusion of a lesson. The conclusion of a lesson. Uh, when I was in high school and college, I used to struggle in math class. And that's kind of strange being as uh, my day job is that of an engineer. Um, but I used to struggle in math class, and what I used to struggle with was mathematical proofs. Uh, you get a formula that you're supposed to use in a particular situation. You got your A squared plus B squared equals C squared when you're working with right triangles, or Y equals MX plus B when you're dealing with the steepness or the slope of a line across the graph, right? You have these formulas that you use to calculate things, and I had trouble in class because the teacher would not just give us the formula to use. If it was a 50 minute class, they had to spend the first 45 minutes proving the formula. They had to talk about where the formula came from and what they tried beforehand and what they tried afterwards and how they know that this formula is true. 
So the teacher would spend about 45 minutes in a 50 minute class and all I needed for my homework and the quizzes and the tests was the formula in the last five minutes. Maybe it's a short attention span. Maybe I spent a little bit too much time playing video games and so I didn't want to pay attention, but that was just me. I only cared about the last five minutes. The most important part to me when I was in math class was the conclusion of the lesson. And just like there was a lesson that would go on in school, there was a lesson going on in the Bible reading that we read earlier. This lesson took place a little bit before the verses we read. We read uh, 14 through 21, but it really, the lesson really starts at John 3 and 1, where a man named Nicodemus meets with Jesus. Some Bible scholars say he came at night, and other Bible scholars say that he stayed there that, that the translation actually means he went there and stayed until the night. But either way, Nicodemus had some questions and he went to Jesus for the answers. Nicodemus is a role model for us. The, the, the man had a question and he went to Jesus for the answers instead of his co-workers. Went to Jesus for the answers instead of his classmates. Went to Jesus for the answers instead of some of his family members. Oh, how much easier our lives would be if when we had a question, we went to the right person for the answers. Somebody that could do something about it. And not only go to the right person for the answers, but stay there until we got them. Nicodemus stayed until he got his answers. In that passage, we learned that Nicodemus is credentialed. He is uh, a Jewish Sanhedrin and a Pharisee. And the Sanhedrin is something during those times, it was kind of like a combination, uh, a council, if you will, that was kind of like the equivalent of the Senate that we have today and the Supreme Court. They could, they could do the laws and they could also decide certain things on them. And he was a Pharisee, so that was something like a lawyer. So he was credentialed. He had some education behind him. And not only that, we see that he confessed. Nicodemus went to Jesus in the passage, writing your Bible in John 3, and he confesses, he acknowledges that Jesus must be from God because of the miracles that he performed. So he's credentialed, and he confesses. And then Jesus commands Nicodemus, telling him that he must be born again. But old Nicodemus gets confused at the command. He thinks that Jesus is talking about a physical rebirth. So Jesus chastises him for not knowing the difference between a physical rebirth and a spiritual rebirth. And after he chastises, he clarifies for him. So we see the credentials. We see the confession, we see the commandment, the chastisement, the clarification, and in the passage that we read, verses 14 through 21, we get the conclusion. The passage starts with an illustration. Verse 14 reads, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so should the Son of Man be lifted up. And who believes in him may have eternal life. He's going to say that again later on in the gospel, according to John. I take a moment right here and just, just, just to tell you, I'm a little partial to the gospel according to John. And I, I guess I'm partial to the gospel according to John because of who my New Testament professor was when I was in seminary, uh, Dr. Jamie Clark Souls. Uh, that was Professor Clark Souls' favorite gospel. Uh, every midterm quiz final we ever took had an extra credit question on it. Which gospel is the best gospel? A, the gospel according to John. B, the gospel according to John. C, the gospel according to John. And D, the gospel according to John. 
that was extra credit. So I pay a little special attention in there because I like the words that he uses when he talks about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word and goes on later on to say in 14, 114, that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And just in case you're not scoring at home, Jesus is the word of God. That is where we get our Christology from, where we think of so highly of Christ in the gospel according to John. That's where we get all of that from. And so I'm a little partial to the gospel according to John because he also says in the gospel according to John in 12 and 32, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. See, in the gospel according to John, John, when he's talking about Jesus, he doesn't really use the word miracle that often. Other people may use it. Nicodemus said miracles when he was talking to Jesus, but when John is talking about what Jesus does, he uses a specific word. Sign. What do signs do? Signs point you in the right direction. Signs give you information. Uh, the first thing I did after I got here is I walked around the building and I saw the historical sign and I read it, read it twice, came in, went back out and read it again because it gave me some context, some information about this church, took a picture of it so that I could see it later because it was a sign that pointed me in the right way. Signs point you in the right direction. And one of the reasons I think that Jesus in the gospel according to John is talking about lifting up again and again in the Bible is because what is the best way to see a sign? You have to put it up high so that people can see it. We ought to lift Jesus up in our lives. Jesus should be on top of everything that we do. When you want to see an exit sign or a direction sign or the street signs coming down here, they're lifted high up so that everybody can see it. They're lifted high up because they're important. They're lifted high up because we can't let other people get in the way of us seeing it. You lift things high up that you don't want other people blocking. So it's a sign. But in the text, we have uh, uh, a couple things that go down in the, the conclusion of this lesson. And the first thing uh, uh, of a three-part conclusion, if I will, is the primary statement. Let the church say primary. Primary, primary meaning of chief importance, principle, main the key, the prime, the central, the significant, or the foremost, primary. And that primary statement is found in chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There is, there is, there is, there is so much to unpack in that verse. I've seen people spend entire sermons on just for God. I've seen people preach an entire year every Sunday that entire verse because there is so much in that verse that is there. The gospel according to John in John 3.16 has pinned our whole theology, our whole understanding of what it means to be a Christian in that one verse. The most popular verse you will ever see listed, John 3.16. You could ask people to quote a Bible verse. You could go out on the street and ask people to quote a Bible verse. And they may not. It, they may quote John 3.16, but if they don't quote it, they can name it. I've seen it on billboards at games. I've seen it on bumper stickers. I've seen it everywhere. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. It's a popular verse for a reason. If you had to explain Christianity in 10 seconds, 
it's probably only one or two verses you're going to go with. You're going to go with Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead, you will be saved. You'll quote that one or you'll quote John 3, 16. It's popular for a reason. And in this verse, we have the father giving of his son. Why? Because he loved us. And he wants what is best for us. And in that same verse, you have the son giving his life for us. Why? Because he loves us and wants what's best for us. Now, I know I've spent some time in seminary, and one of the things that they're doing in seminary right now is trying to remove us from what we call patriarchal language. You know, they don't want us to always mention he, 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 and mi- mi- mix some, some, fe- some, some female-friendly language in there. And, and I can understand that because you can alienate people. But there are some verses that it just, it's just right. A father wants what's best for his children. A father loves us. A father sacrifices for us. And I begin to understand that even more so as I begin to raise children myself. I understand that it's okay if I don't eat. As long as my children eat, it's okay because I love them and I want what is best for them. So we have in this verse, this primary statement, we have a father giving his son up for us because he loves us and wants what's best for us. And we have a son giving his life for us because he loves us and wants what's best for us. That is the primary statement in the conclusion of the lesson. It just fits. God loves us, gave his only begotten son, and the son loves us, so he gave us his life. God and Jesus both love us, and they did not want to see us fail. So they did something about it. They did not want us to see death, hell, and the grave. So they did something about it. They wanted us to have eternal life. So they did something about it. So we have this primary statement. And then we have the purpose. Let the church say purpose. Purpose. The purpose of the lesson is for us to learn that we are not to condemn sinners the purpose one of the purposes is for us to learn that Jesus came not to condemn sinners I feel sometimes we spend way too much time focusing on other sins now I'm not saying that to give people a free pass to do whatever they do but we should not have our primary focus to be to focus on other people's sins I don't know about you all but I don't have a heaven or a hell to put anybody else in so I'm going to let God deal with them and I'm going to keep it moving because it says very clearly in the text that we read it said that what's done in the dark will come to the light It can be a leaked email or somebody turning on their camera phone while you are on a charter bus coming home from a game singing about there will never be a what? At what's done in the dark will come in to the light. So it's not my place to handle it. To quote the old adage, your arms are too short to box with God. So I will let God deal with it. Not me. We are not to condemn sinners. Secondly, we can't spend too much time condemning sinners because the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. To sin means to miss the mark. And Jesus is here to get us back on track. So he came not to condemn sinners, but to convert sinners. We quote Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but I am so happy 
about verse 24. For it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you all, but when I look back over my life and I see where I've come from and seeing where I could have been, all I can say is if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be without God's grace, the unmerited favor of the Lord. I don't deserve it, but he saw fit to save me. Justify me by his saving grace to be redeemed in Christ Jesus so we don't have to spend time focusing on the condemning. He came to convert. So we have the primary statement and we have the purpose and then we have the people. Let the church say people. People. That's what this is about. Because in the conversation that Jesus was having with Nicodemus, it turns from I and you to we. If you flow through the text, which leads us to believe that there were other people there getting the same lesson that Jesus was giving. And so it wasn't just for Nicodemus. It was for everybody around. And then it's not only for everybody around, it's for everybody who will read it later. The conclusion of the lesson is that Jesus saves. God's only son provides eternal life. That is the conclusion of the lesson. And back to those mathematical proofs that I said I had trouble with in the beginning. Well, I learned a little later as I got a little more advanced in math that there is a law in mathematics called the law of the excluded principle. And what that law basically means is that when you have a formula, the formula is either true or false. Can't be in between. And so because it's either true or false, it can't be in between. It's never in the middle. The law of the excluded middle. And so the same way we approach these mathematical formulas is the same way that I choose to approach the Bible. Either I believe it or I don't. Nothing in the middle. Either I'm going to do what it says or I don't. Nothing in the middle. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should seek cause to repent. Has he said or will he not do or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God said it. That settles it. The Bible says that God's word should never return to him void. It should go out and accomplish the thing that he's doing. God says it. What God says, God will do. The Bible says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me for the love of God. I believe it. God says it. That settles it. How did he do it? He did it on a Friday morning. On a hill called Calvary. He had to carry his own cross. And I done did some research about the cross. And something that I've learned is that the cross itself, an entire cross, was over 300 pounds. The cross beams that he got to get hung to, that's 100 pounds. He had to carry that all the way to Calvary. And not only did he have that hundred pounds he had to carry, but he was carrying your sins and my sins. And he was taking them to the grave. And he died. He died for you and me. But that's not where the story ends. Because three days later, he got up with all power in his hands so that whosoever shall believe in him shall be saved and have everlasting life. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come.